Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What an absolute pleasure it is to be here at the Global FinTech uh, Fest. I have to congratulate the organizers, the NPCI, uh, all of the industry stakeholders who are here uh, to put together what has really been a fabulous marquee event, uh, bringing together different voices, different opinions on what it will actually take uh, to make this India's big moment in, uh, in FinTech. And that really is the story that we're here uh, to talk about. It's always a pleasure for me to speak with Mr. Kamath. Mr. Kamath, thank you so thank you. much for, uh, for joining us here this morning. And let's start with that $5 trillion milestone. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but Mr. Kamath is a big India bull, a perpetual India bull. So let's start with that milestone number $5 trillion. Uh, Mr. Kamath, do you think that that's an underestimation of the potential? Yeah, I think uh, that number needs to be reset, uh, Shirin. Uh, when you talk to this August company and uh, considering that they will drive India, I think we need to talk about a 25 trillion number, <laughs> say 25 trillion in 25 years, or uh, 25 trillion uh, India at 100 uh, after independence. Okay, that's the first headline, 25 trillion for India at 100, that's the milestone that you hope uh, we are going to be able to touch. But let's talk about the contribution of this sector in specific, Mr. Kamat. And I want to set this into context because a few days ago when we last spoke, you held out a fairly cautionary warning for the banking sector. You gave the banks between three to five years. You said if the banks do not disrupt themselves, they will largely start to go out of business. And you, three to five years is, is now, it's not somewhere down the future. So let's first talk about the contribution and the role that you believe the banking sector can play in being able to get to that $25 trillion number and then the fintechs. Yeah, actually, uh, what I should speak about is the role that the assembled uh, guests the, here would play. They're keen to know what, what's going to happen to the banking sector as yes, well. <laughs> uh, what they would play in, uh, in that 25 trillion, uh, what number I would believe they legitimately will uh, aspire for in that 25 trillion. And uh, consequent to that, what are the challenges uh, the rest of the financial uh, sector would face if they do not reinvent themselves. So uh, just staying on the headline, uh, my belief is that uh, the digital India will... Uh, contribute to not less than 25%, between 25 and 30% of this 25 trillion. So you're really looking at uh, you know, a big chunk of growth uh, coming from uh, people who are assembled here and or they enable this growth to happen, either or. And uh, the challenge and the opportunity for uh, existing fintech financial services players is uh, how to use uh, fintech that is emerging uh, on the horizon or already Know, already there uh, to their good because if they do not uh, use it appropriately uh, I think they will face challenges so uh, again uh, we can talk about it in detail but I will just maybe uh, arouse curiosity by saying if you look at uh, it has already started if you look at uh, the broking business uh, incumbent brokers who have been there for 20 30 years in digital mode providing digital services are under uh, enormous threat from uh, newer players who are uh, virtually digital only. So it's the start of uh, a process of change which will uh, slowly, uh, I think, pervade. So uh, I hope uh, uh, five, five years that uh, I caution will not happen, but there's a lot of work to be done by uh, incumbent players. While there's a lot of work to be done by incumbents to ensure that they don't get disrupted and are not, in fact, out of business, let's talk about the opportunities for people in this audience. When we talk about uh, fintechs, uh, and the story perhaps in the last five years has moved from fintechs versus banks to fintechs co-opting with banks or fintechs collaborating and cooperating with banks. How do you see this coexistence? Is it likely to be a happy coexistence in yeah, the future? I think uh, there are several layers or um, you know, overlays of coexistence. Actually, it starts with the India stack. Uh, the governor yesterday talked about it, so I w and everyone here knows uh, what it is. So the India stack is the centerpiece of uh, this whole, uh, I would say, um, alliance for good the digital good of uh, this country. And uh, we build on that. And this is very interesting because that stack is uh, enabled by, uh, I would say, a public-private partnership, mm. predominantly public. You know, government provides the rails, as it were, for that partnership. And nowhere else in the world I know of that it is really a government-driven good. So I think this is uh, on a solid foundation in uh, India. 
thereafter comes uh, the other uh, constituents, uh, players, whether it is uh, incumbents or new course, new startups who are uh, getting into this area, who will be enabled by uh, the new uh, technology players. You know, other day I think I made a statement that uh, you can virtually replace the technology in a bank with the technology on a SaaS model that some of the players and some of the names I see here have already implemented. And uh, I can vouch works. So we have reached that stage. And so if an incumbent doesn't uh, see what is uh, about to happen, I think uh, it's not going to be uh, happy days. If you were still running a bank today, Mr. Kamath, would you be writing out checks to people in this audience? Do you believe that that is what we're likely to see more of now, banks going out there and buying fintechs? Banks have no options. I, I had a guest from uh, abroad the other day, one of the largest global banks. When I mentioned to him uh, what is uh, possible, the only thing the rest of the conversation was uh, make sure that, uh, telling his local person, make sure that I have uh, the names of those companies uh, who provide this sort of a disruption. So I think uh, this ability of uh, people in this uh, uh, fintech uh, uh, function uh, to disrupt and collaborate is enormous. So yes, from the India, the India end, uh, the stack that is already there, enabling uh, digitization of uh, existing players, I think is, uh, is, is going to be there uh, uh, as, a, as a huge disruptor. And I will, for a moment, talk of the global opportunity mm. because this tag from what I have seen and I have seen banking sectors uh, all through from uh, the time we started off in 1997 to today. What has happened? How uh, evolved are these? In most countries it is not evolved. So that's also an opportunity. So digital India, uh, you know, in the fintech world in particular, has an uh, opportunity to scale what they have done across India and globally. Mm. So they should look at that as uh, the big uh, opportunity. So the global opportunity and the global aspiration, you believe that that is going to be a viable option for uh, Indian fintech founders to consider uh, focusing on at this point in time? Or do you believe that that is something that maybe a few years down the line, once they consolidate their yeah. position here in India, uh, is when they should start See, looking if, out? Uh, if we were having this chat, uh, say, a year and a half, two years back, when I'd really not started looking at what is available, and, uh, and I knew things were happening, and today, uh, when I know that uh, things are available, I would say the time is now. Uh, what uh, the startups probably need to really look at is uh, how do you partner with the global players who need you mm. and how do you provide that value add to that uh, marketplace mm. um, while you are doing uh, it for India in any case. You know, uh, Mr. Kamath, you just spoke about value add and this is the conversation that I want to have with you. Uh, so far, at least as far as the banking and financial services sector was concerned, one of the big differentiators or one of the big moats was the regulatory moat. If that is going to be less and less of a consideration, what do you believe will need to be the moats that people will build around themselves? I see, uh, you're right, uh, Shireen, and uh, I would look at it this way. If uh, regulation was a barrier, then we would not have today. This is what is yeah. happening here would not have happened. And uh, we would not have heard uh, from uh, uh, the governor, what uh, he said uh, yesterday. Uh, he believes, uh, and the Reserve Bank clearly believes in uh, co-creation, because most of these initiatives that have been taken, starting with NPCI, is a co-creation effort. And uh, from there, you know, allowing things to uh, flow in a very even manner, mm -hmm. in a manner which is uh, not uh, you know, going to have risk built layer on layer, but uh, in a manner that risk is uh, understood and then uh, uh, you uh, roll out uh, what was called the sandbox approach, mm. I think is what's going to drive uh, business. And uh, uh, they will, from what I could see, continue to be partners and in a measured way allow a greater entry of uh, other players into the actual financial system as it were. When you say the actual financial system, do you mean the banking system? Yeah, that's, why, that's exactly what I mean, whether it's the NBFC or the banking system to actually allow uh, them to uh, be uh, participants. Today, they are enablers. I think uh, the day is not far when they will be participants. Uh, it's a question of a regulatory trust because uh, ultimately the regulator looks after and ensures that the deposits that are taken by the institution are secure. That's the primary responsibility that the regulator always articulates. So once that is uh, established, uh, I think uh, it would be uh, that that's when the opening would happen. But before that, 
on the technology side, it is already established. Hmm. You know, the, the technology side, as you said, is established, but let's talk about the road ahead as far as fintechs are concerned. And while there is a great opportunity, there is headroom for significant growth at this point in time, the question also is on the monetization ability and the monetization opportunity that presents itself for fintechs. In your view, of fit hair, free hair, uh, which, is, which is what you believe to be the case. What are the imperatives uh, for fintechs as they look at their own uh, you know, financial muscle and their own financial strength? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, I want to, you know, maybe the audience doesn't know the fit hair and free hair. See, what uh, all the entrepreneurs here, they have done, here have done is clearly proven that the technology they have is, uh, if you had to ask fit hair kya, the answer is absolutely, resolutely, yes, fit, hey. So they have proven it. And I'm benchmarking with technology that was available uh, over the last 20, 25 years. Stalwarts have built it and so on. But technology that's been built here is uh, fit. And uh, free, hey, is a way of speaking. Free, mm. hey, doesn't mean that it is at zero cost. Everybody has to make uh, uh, adequate profit, reasonable profit. You can set your degree of reasonableness yourself, but you have to make it profit. But compared to what you are used to pay, uh, this is virtually free. That's what I mean, uh, free hey, yeah, compared to what you are paying. Mm. So um, I would think that everyone is uh, today uh, building that sort of uh, platform. And uh, that will be what uh, will attract a user to it, uh, whether it's a bank or you become a bank and uh, you uh, progress. Mm. And this is happening in a world where uh, I, I say there are four Ds at play. Um, so it is uh, demographic. And demographic is not our old definition of demographic. Uh, demographic, what I mean is the great leveler where uh, the, a young person of 20 and a person not so old of 70 use technology almost as facilely. Not exactly as facilely, but almost as facilely. Then uh, you have got uh, uh, you know, technology which is uh, demonetized. You, in mm. a way, you used a phrase monetized. Uh, demonetized. By demonetization, I mean uh, you go at the other end and see things which are today uh, you know, take an Airbnb or a Uber or this. To me, it's a demonetized uh, thing. And at every end, when you look at these, this is where uh, the new technology is used. Dematerialized. Mm. You don't need to look beyond uh, the device in your pocket, which now does 10, 20 things, which otherwise uh, you were doing uh, physically. And there are several more Ds I can add, disruptive, digital, and so on. But this is the universe that uh, this, this universe plays in. The reason I talked about this is that Every year, the touch point is digital. In all these four Ds or five Ds that I talked about, everywhere touch point is digital. And that's what is going to drive uh, India, and indeed, uh, the globe as we go along. And uh, yes, you serve India, and you have a larger opportunity for serving the globe. Uh, that point you made. And since we're talking about serving the globe and we're talking about learning from uh, experiences outside of India as well, I want to uh, get you to sort of uh, talk to us about your experience in China, because that has been an economy that has seen the digitization wave, uh, you know, again, make the kind of leapfrog that we anticipate uh, India will make as well. I, I want to understand from you the changes that that brought about for the economy, the opportunities it opened up, and what could potentially be lessons here for us. Yeah, again, uh, I think there are vast differences in what has happened there and what has happened here. Uh, yes, uh, they went uh, into payments uh, very early on. Uh, WeChat and Alipay uh, went into payments very early on. But the rest of it is very interesting. If I were to actually look at uh, a Chinese bank, it's far more, uh, far less digital than an Indian bank. It's an Indian bank. But uh, there are you know, technology enablers who are, you know, five years back or four years back, when I lived there, uh, probably were uh, you know, at a better at a higher level than in India. <clears throat> but in four years, I can say this without any hesitation, there is virtually no area where we are behind today. And that is, to me, the biggest uh, driving force for us. <laughs> and who has made it possible? This uh, group of entrepreneurs here has made it possible. And within this, if I were to just pick uh, one or two uh, areas, it becomes very uh, clear. Uh, take, for example, the data. Mm. I still struggle to believe that uh, we use the largest uh, you know, quantity of data yeah. and at the lowest price point. Yes. So there itself is a story. Data elsewhere, you know, capacity was set up at a price point which was much higher. Yeah. 
So the costs are higher to the end user. But we have, in the last three, four years, been able to roll out data at a price point never ever seen anywhere. Yeah. And as a consequence, the user, the lay user, can uh, use it uh, you know, at that price mm. point. And that makes it pervade and touch everybody that uh, is around us, whether uh, he is a, a literate or an illiterate yeah. today, uh, uses data as almost as well. So I think these differences to me will uh, stand in our good. And uh, just to digress for a moment, Almost all areas where we used to bemoan that we are late to the party, huh. we now say that it's good that we were late to the party because we are drawing or reaping the benefits of a price point which is much lower. Data is an example. So data to me has been a big opener in terms of uh, what has been done. Oh, absolutely. I, I think I completely agree with you there uh, on not just the consumption that we're seeing, the consumption boom that we're seeing on account of uh, easy access to data, but also, as you pointed out, the lowest cost of data. Not good news as far as telecom companies are concerned who complain about the average revenue per user, but that's a matter for another. But they are still making good profit. <laughs> Anybody well done <laughs> they, is making they, profit. They, they'll that, argue, they'll argue that about that, point. but that's a that's matter for another, another conversation, Mr. Kamat. But you know, you talked about, for instance, the kind of disruptions that we've seen. You talked about the broking businesses as one of them. Given uh, the, the various opportunities that we've seen fintechs address at this point in time, what are the unaddressed gaps? What are the white spaces that you still believe that uh, people should focus on? The white space is scaling up. Because I can't see any area where uh, they are not in. And I will uh, sketch some of those which I did not believe uh, People had already got a product, but uh, I am uh, very heartened when I see that uh, the product exists. So the white space is now uh, the, the great, I don't know, three, three, three and uh, three quarter uh, trillion uh, economy. Uh, you take it to um, uh, 25 trillion. So that gives you enough white space to uh, grow, uh, thrive, and survive. So I don't see any uh, white spaces at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I lack of white space or uh, growth mm -hmm. opportunities at mm -hmm. all. But given the uh, advantage that we enjoy in the specific areas where we've already started to make headway, uh, what do you believe uh, can be done or what should be prioritized at this point in time? Yeah, priority is very simple. I think uh, if you talk fintech, um, there, as I said, uh, you, know, you go up the value chain from broking to asset management to insurance to uh, financial services, whether bank or NBFCs. Look at what is uh, you know, possible in the fintech world and provide. See, today you can, I was uh, you know, just looking at uh, how, how does one look at, let us say, mortgage financing today compared to what we did uh, 20 years back. Today it's a, virtually can be a faceless experience. It can be entirely digitally driven, including all your document uh, verification and document certification. Who has made it possible? No bank has made it possible. People here have made it possible. So virtually there is nothing that they have not worked on. Uh, the opportunity now is to scale it and uh, to, uh, you know, we look for the next big thing that uh, they think is... Uh, uh, what do you believe the next big thing is likely to be, Mr. Kamath? I mean, what would you place your bets on today? No, my, my bet is very simple, scale. Uh, so I don't want to say... Because I can't see anything that they have not done. Everything that uh, you can think of is in place. Okay. Uh, everything is in place. I am going to take a few questions if you do have them. So do keep your questions ready. In a, another minute or so, I will give you an opportunity to raise your hands and then uh, and put the question across to you. Uh, Mr. Kamath, I, you know, I want to talk to you about a number. I'm, I'm going to be speaking with Kunal Shah, one of the founders in the fintech space in a second. Uh, and this is an interesting statistic that he, he threw up. Uh, uh, where he talks about the fact that there are 180 companies in India who make more than a thousand crore rupees in profit after tax, approximately 28 percent, that's 180 companies are in the BFSI space. Given the opportunities that you believe this sector can enjoy, what could that number potentially look like? 100,000. 100,000? I'm not kidding. There are 100,000 startups today in the digital space, not just fintech space. I think everybody has a potential to grow to this size because if you look at the value added that uh, they have, uh, I think it's a question of pacing because uh, at times, uh, you know, I, whatever I have seen and uh, gone deep into that has been created, there's enormous value. So I call it platform value. The platform that has been created, for lack of a word, I'm using platform in a very wide sense, is enormous. But somehow, some of the funding partners have uh, set uh, unrealistic uh, valuation part. Mm. So if you can navigate this uh, slightly wobbly ground, 
between the enormous value created in the platform and the expectation on, then you, I think, uh, uh, will not have any problems. Okay. Uh, you know, you talked about valuation, Mr. Kamath, and I think uh, th this would be instructive for people in this room as well, uh, because there's been a, there's been perhaps an unhealthy obsession with valuation, with this need to churn out unicorn week after week, day after day, second after second. What is the advice that you would leave here with this audience as they go yeah. about building a business, not just extracting valuation? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I say that uh, you have built a great business. I endorse that, that platform value is enormous. You now need to look at uh, how to make that platform profitable and then scale it with profitability as a key core component of what uh, you want to do. And value will emerge. But if you reverse it and uh, look at value first or valuation first, then you will have a problem. Mm. Uh, so, so you have created value in your business, the valuation has to follow. You're Keep a believer. You're a believer in the story. But are you a believer in the profitable growth of this story? I always believe in profitable growth. There is no growth without profitability. Because it will be short-lived. And I don't want anyone uh, here uh, to uh, you know, fall uh, consequent to that uh, approach. So without profitability, there is no growth. That, that, is, that is something that every, everyone must focus on. Yeah. But, uh, you know, at this point in time, and, and I think many are grappling with this dilemma, uh, there has been money. The, the VCs have put in and pumped in a fair amount of money at this point in time, and that perhaps is going to start to taper, or at least has started to, to taper. In that situation, the argument is that, look, we needed this money to be able to build out this market, to be able to change behaviors. Uh, profit will happen, it will happen in time. Uh, how do you react or respond to that argument? So I will say that uh, you needed money initially, certainly, to build a platform, the, again, the widest sense, uh, the business uh, that you have built, and you've done a great job of it. At, at, some time, at some point in time, you need to take, take stock. What next? Uh, what is my path to uh, you know, create profit, which will create the valuation that I want? So like any good business, I think uh, we have grown so rapidly, uh, all of uh, the collective uh, set of companies here, that uh, we need to find, uh, uh, get, sit down and find out uh, where do we go from here in terms of creating that uh, valuation, creating that valuation, not saying that this is our valuation and please give us that valuation. Mm. It's, not, it's not as easy as turning a switch on and no. off, but uh, uh, you know, that there will be a distance to cover for, for many uh, in this room as well. But you talked about the global aspiration, and that is something that you want to leave this audience with, is not just to think India, but to think outside of India as well. I want to ask you about the big breakout moment for UPI and what that could potentially mean for people in this room as well. I think uh, the breakout moment for UPI has already happened. Is, that breakout moment is acceptance of UPI within India uh, as the uh, global breakout. I'm talking. Yeah, I, I'm coming to that. Yeah. So because without without this happening, that would not have happened. So that has happened. It is proven. It is now only a question of scale. You know, we heard numbers yesterday: 10 billion a month to 100 billion is the revised target. I think it will happen. I am 100 percent sure that will happen. What I'm saying is at that point, as we grow from 10 billion a month to 100 billion a month, this will become an imperative. Now, you have anybody coming from anywhere in the world uh, looking at India, and they actually are amazed at this, particularly the Western world. Uh, so, I think the opportunity is already there. It is now uh, for us to drive. So, how could we drive? Mm. We could drive it in several ways. You know, players who, are, uh, who have the experience, expertise in this could become partners to global uh, financial institutions, uh, work with global regulators. Uh, to roll out uh, equivalent products uh, in those uh, domains. And it can happen because it is probably all the 200 and odd countries around the world, uh, this is a product that uh, will find uh, favor. And the only other uh, competing product is probably there in one or two countries. So uh, your opportunity is global and the time is now. And uh, I would think that uh, the venture partners who are funded uh, could do well if uh, they were to fund that single uh, and that would provide a big wave of Indian companies going abroad and uh, actually making a profit. Because in those markets, you would not have to undercut like you are here. Uh, you, uh, in a fit high care, you 100% are uh, fit. Free high care, you will probably be, uh, uh, you know, probably not as free as you are in India. You will probably get higher return. 
that, that, that is a possibility, but uh, the time is now to start thinking about going global. That's the other big message that's coming in uh, from Mr. Kamath. We talked about the breakout moment for the UPI, and I also want to address the issue of the CBDC with you, uh, because the governor here held out of a large, audacious target as far as the CBDC is concerned as well. What could that potentially mean also as an opportunity uh, you know, for, for the fintech community that, uh, that we're addressing today? Again, I think we need to look at uh, certain things happening globally to put in context CBDC and indeed UPI. And that is the events of the last two years. I think uh, create opportunities which you never thought uh, were, uh, you know, were uh, uh, you know, possible. So you basically we are getting to a situation where you need to think about the settlement currency and how settlement happens. Domestically, UPI settles in rupee. Now we need to look at how will settlement happen in, with the digital currency in India, uh, central bank currency. And I'm sure that same currency, uh, the next step is going to be settling uh, globally using that same currency. And uh, that would be much more elegant than using uh, the way we settle today in a, in a cross-border way. So uh, that would drive, uh, again, this uh, global reach that Indian companies will have as we go along. Mr. Kamath, I believe that we're uh, out of time, so let me end by asking you, uh, if, if you were to uh, uh, be working in a bank today, would you be nervous? No. Would you be optimistic or feel confident? Uh, uh, or would you want to do something completely different outside of banking? If I, if I could not change the mindset of my people, uh, I would be uh, you know, a nervous wreck because uh, there would be no future. So starting with myself, my entire team has to, has to be aligned that change is imperative. I cannot go about saying that, you know, oh, this app of mine, you know, it'll take 18 months for me to redo. And people sitting here will say that I can do it in uh, probably 18 days. So that's the sort of difference we are seeing. So I would be, I would be trembling. So, uh, so I would still continue to work and uh, hope that I can uh, change uh, the mindset of my organization. But as uh, Chris Gopalishno was saying, uh, things are changing on a daily basis. Yeah. And if I think that uh, things will change for me in, uh, once in three or five years, I am dead. Yes, as, as the president of the uh, Olympic Committee told me, change or be changed, yes. that really is the dilemma uh, facing many across different sectors and different industries today. My final question to you, Mr. Kamath, and you know, this is something that, uh, uh, that perhaps people will want to hear from you. What does it take to build an enduring institution that lasts the many ups and down cycles that the economy goes through that stands the test of time? What would you put down as the top three or the top five things that no, they I'm, must focus I'm on? Only top one. Top one is you need to be, particularly in today's universe, and we have seen it even earlier, but today particular, you have to be a continuously learning organization and an organization which is uh, able to adapt and uh, change on a daily basis. What you said, change is the only constant. Uh, we used to say it in some other way earlier, but to me these would be the two things. Rest of it will follow. So you basically need to learn on a daily basis, reinvent yourself and change. Continue to be a learning organization. That's the big takeaway and that's the big message here from KV Kamata. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the man, the legend, who has shaped India's financial sector in so many ways. And I think, uh, uh, you know, take, take away uh, the message that he sent out, uh, think beyond India, think global. Think, of course, about building profitable, sustainable businesses and more importantly, the time is now. Act today. Uh, don't don't wait for all uh, all the pieces of the puzzle to fall into place. Uh, this this is the opportunity and make the most of it. Mr. Kamath, many many thanks for joining us here this morning. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much.